Thank you very much for the organizers for allowing us to provide the venue for discussion. And uh, my talk today is part um, is titled Hyperbolic Geometry, Natural Stimuli, Neural Responses. Our lab for the past several years have become very interested in this um, topic. And we have been working in um, um, different sensory modalities and um, including olfaction and auditory responses. So this project is part of a larger collaboration together with Ellie Nelken, David Hansel, and late Carl van Vriesnik. And today I will focus on um, telling you about neural responses in uh, the hippocampus. And uh, I think um, hopefully there will be overlap with a no uh, several presentations from yesterday and today. Um, in particular, how experience expands these representations. So, what, um, what I would like to share you, with you my reasons for the enthusiasm as to why um, I think that hyperbolic geometry is broadly applicable to both natural stimuli, perception, neural responses, decision making, and uh, other um, so in, in some cases, when I give a talk, people ask that maybe it should be the null hypothesis. So here is my reasons for it being the null hypothesis. So in many cases, as you know, we, we are dealing with hierarchical tree-like data. Um, it can be in decision making. It can be in the stimuli that are received by a periphery, but are really generated by a small low dimensional model that is obscured. So we are recording here and we are interested in latent causes. So when we have a hierarchical structure like this, to evaluate distances between points, we have to go back to the hidden causes and back out. For example, in, we will do it with phylogenetic networks. So the corresponding continuous approximation to the distances between nodes is not the straight line that connects them but something that goes inside the network. And that turns out to have um, a hyperbolic metric. And then uh, another reason, my second reason, that is, um, I think is very pertinent to neural networks and biological networks in particular, is that how do you communicate between different parts of the network? And that includes encoding stimuli um, and also reporting on the status of the nervous system from different parts to each other. So it turns out there is a series of interesting papers uh, by Dmitry Krukov and collaborators about efficient routing of information. And of course, it's very relevant even um, for our networks where we have like supply chain disruptions. So it turns out that when a network can be mapped onto, um, has hidden hyperbolic geometry, then this allows for efficient routing of signals, even in the cases where some nodes are going down. And without this, um, then you can have um, places where the, the routing is not efficient. So that's uh, um, the simulations that they said how um, so to sustain internet, for example, with hyperbolic mapping. So, um, today, um, I will um, not, not, so this is kind of the previous work that I will not be highlighting today, but we have in the past um, analyzed hyperbolic geometry in natural order statistics, in gene expression, and today I will um, summarize, so this is natural stimuli, this is kind of on the molecular level. And today we will talk about neural representation, and I will share with you a new result that with experience, um, these neural representations grow, and the, uh, the size of the hyperbolic network is actually matches the maximum information or maximum entropy that could be received in, um, in units of discrete time. So, um, so of course, uh, we all know that uh, cells in the uh, hippocampus, in the CA1, are responding to uh, select parts in the, um, our environment. They're called place cells. And now, how is that related to a hierarchical representation? 
So this is meant as a cartoon to provide you with intuition for hyperbolic um, geometry. We are not going to actually use this construction. But imagine that you have different kinds of place fields. Some are big and some are small. And imagine lifting this into, from a two-dimensional representation of different sizes into a three-dimensional representation where the center is as is, but the height corresponds to the size of the place field. So a big place field will be kind of a coarse-grained um, root node. And then if one place field is completely within another, you draw a solid line. And if they partially overlap, you draw a dashed line. So this is a technique or a method that uh, purportedly was known to um, you know, uh, anyway, to reconstruct the tree of life. So you, you, you can see, I, I forgot. <laughs> um, anyway, so we analyzed here the data from um, Albert Lee's group in Janelia. So they're very interested in very large environments. And here is a depiction of different kinds of place fields. So this is on a very large scale, about 50 meters. And you can have large place fields and a tiny place fields. And one of the signatures of hyperbolic geometry is that you would have this exponential increase in the number of small place fields. So a first early indicator is that if you plot the number of place fields as a function of its size, you should have an exponential distribution. And that's what we observed by analyzing Albert Lee's data. Now, uh, more um, quantitatively, I said it's a cartoon because, um, um, you know, what if the neurons have multiple place fields and so on? So from this perspective, we are going to do an embedding. We are looking for hidden geometry. So meaning I'm starting with, um, suppose I give, we start from different cities on Earth, and I give you distances between them. And using these distances, one should be able to figure out that we are dealing with spherical geometry that is embedded in a three-dimensional Euclidean world. So we live on a surface, which is a low dimensional, lower dimensional surface than a 3D world, and the surface is curved. And we can figure it out by measuring distances between points on that surface. The same idea, but now with respect to neural data uh, and so on. So you start with the distance matrix between points, where each point is a neuron. And we have a distance matrix. And then we will try these points, like on a mannequin, um, on different geometric models. So one mannequin will be a sphere. Another one will be a hyperbolic surface, and also there will be Euclidean surfaces. And these mannequins will have different dimensions. And we put the same number of points as we have in the experiment on these mannequins, and then we generate um, what distance matrix you would expect. And there you have lots of choices for how to match data to a hypothesized model. One of them will be the method just mentioned in the previous talk I think, um, by Karina Kurta and Vladimir Itzkov, topological methods. We also use this one. Um, but there are other methods, and you, we can talk later after the talk. Uh, there are other methods. But for the purposes of this talk, I will just briefly mention that we use this topological method that converts this matrix, thresholds it, and measures the number of cycles in the resulting network. And these are these um, Betty curves, and, and they are like kind of signature of the underlying matrix. And these Betty curves are rather sensitive to, um, sensitive and at the same time robust to the signatures of this distance matrix. And the goal is to match the data of Betty curves to the model Betty curves. And um, these are figures from the Karina Curtis paper and our innovation to also show that these curves are sensitive to differences between hyperbolic and Euclidean geometry. So now back to the data from the hippocampus. So what is shown here are these topological characteristics, and the uh, dashed line are the data, and these are different topological characteristics of order one, two, and three. 
And here is the model. And the same thing, the data is here in dashed lines and the model. So one can clearly see that Euclidean um, it is not consistent with the data, but hyperbolic is. And um, so this is one uh, evidence. And then, of course, there are other data sets. So we are grateful for CRCNS for organizing these data sets, making them publicly available. So in this case, we took data from Yuri Buzaki's group. So instead of large linear track, it's now a relatively small square um, environment. And again, we see that the three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry accounts for the data, and Euclidean does not account for the data. So here we test this hypothesis in different scales, either a very large scale and linear, or a um, more typical scale, one to two meter scale, and the data is still has hierarchical and hyperbolic structure. So that's one conclusion, one minute, okay. So the most, there are two interesting findings here. One is, so I showed you that the data is hyperbolic, but what is interesting is that in the case of Buzaki data, when they bring back the animal, um, to the same environment, it turns out that the radius grows. And it grows according to this line, and the line is not a simple line, but it's a logarithmic line, and it's derived by theoretical grounds of the maximum entropy that you can gain from a discrete number of processes. So here we see that the growth, the environment is growing, and um, uh, actually, we, I will skip this for this lack of time, but I will just mention that this uh, space is breathing even on short time scales. So when the animal is running a little bit faster, the space will shrink less. When it slows down, like we say during learning, take your time to learn. It's important because it gives time for the synaptic plasticity to create these larger neural representations. And then the second, I would say, interesting finding is it turns out what is the optimal size of this hyperbolic representation. And it turns out if you have a small number of neurons, the, the optimal size or hyperbolic radius is small because you cannot sample a very large size. And we did simulations, and if you go from 50 neurons to 50,000 neurons, it turns out that the optimal hyperbolic radius shifts and if you plot the optimal radius here versus the number of neurons, you have a nice a linear relationship on a log scale. And curiously, here is the data point from data. So it falls perfectly onto this line, indicating that the curvature that we have seen in the hippocampus matches what you would expect the optimal for the available number of CA1 neurons. So I will now summarize my talk saying that what we find is that representations in the hippocampus are hyperbolic and they become more detailed and grow. Is this like time is out? Is that the... Uh, <laughs> no? <laughs> okay, so I will then summarize. So they increase with the logarithm of time and the average size is matched to the size of neurons in the hippocampus. So um, I would like to thank our CRCNA support and say that this is part of the collaboration with Ellen Nelkin and Arbel Please Group. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? How, how do you deal with the uh, 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 parameter cell have a multiple receptor field, like for neuron with a multiple receptor? How do you treat those cells? You mean go, how many, um, if you have multiple fields? Or yeah, how do you how treat them? Fields? So the reason um, we, um, we didn't use this picture as a literal picture, you can use this picture literally, but if you have multiple fields, then I, you know, how do you do it? So you do it through correlations. So you compute the distance between neurons by how much they're correlated. And if this correlation comes from a single place field or multiple place fields is then immaterial, then from this you build the data matrix and, um, and, and you go from there. So the, the distance matrix is not built from place field but based from correlation 
between neural responses. Okay, and that bypasses the definition of the place fields altogether. Any other questions? Hey, so you have expo uh, uh, the exponential distribution, uh, but you have error bars in the experiment. Yes, and it's difficult to distinguish between an exponential and a log normal. So what would change if it was log normal in the data? Yes, so thank you. Thank you for your question. So of course, from my perspective, the log normal and exponential are really the same distribution except for very small place fields. And the very small place fields is um, hard to measure and I think they're undersampled in reality. So every time we hear, that is, I hear a log normal probability distribution, I really think that this means exponential distribution and that can be used as evidence for hyperbolic geometry. So I think the, you know, Yuri Buzaki's thesis that you know, there are log normal distributions in the synapses and, and everywhere that actually is coherent with the hyperbolic hypothesis. Okay, thank you.